Sure, yeah, maybe I'll introduce myself first and then Keith and Emily, you can introduce yourself just so they can get to know uh, who, who, who we are and, and Ryan's back. So I'll, I'll just introduce myself really quickly. My name is Kyle Monahan, Senior Data Science Specialist with TTS. Uh, thanks to all of you for attending and I look forward to, uh, to talking with you today. Um, uh, maybe, I guess, Ryan, would you like to take it from here? Sure, sorry about that, everyone. As we can imagine, the internet is not behaving. Um, so what I was planning on saying was that we're here for the session from five to six on uh, stat software for professional development. At six o'clock, we'll be transitioning over into our statistics comparisons across state of SAS and R part one, um, which will be continued then tomorrow uh, from five to seven o'clock. Um, and the Zoom links will be sent out for that tonight. At six o'clock, you're more than welcome to also join our concurrent session with uh, Binji, Zhao, and Echo Liang. We'll be uh, talking about data dashboards for nutrition research. Um, with that, I'm just going to open it up. Uh, Case, you can provide yourself a small introduction. So we'll go Case, myself, and Emily, and then we're going to turn it over to Kyle uh, to begin his talk on Stat Software. All right, yeah. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. My name is Case. I am a uh, second year nutritional epidemiology and data science student at the Friedman School. Um, just have a lot of interest in um, programming languages and um, software. So I'm exciting, excited to be taking part in this. Uh, workshop. Hand it off to Emily. Sure. Evening, everyone. And it's March 1st, so I want to say happy National Nutrition Month. Um, I'm a registered dietitian. Yeah, I saw some whoop whoops. It definitely is. Um, I am a registered dietitian in my second semester at Tufts um, doctoral program in nutritional epidemiology and data science. And I just want to share that with, um, from my experience, I didn't really code um, between my masters in this program. And so what I'm excited to share is what I've learned really in, in one and a half semesters and hopefully inspire or encourage um, beginners um, like I would still identify myself to be uh, to take the plunge code and learn multiple softwares. So I'm excited that you're all here and uh, to share my experience with you as well. Awesome. Well, thank you very much uh, to, to, to everyone for, uh, for coming. Um, I will uh, just start by sharing my screen. And let me do that. Uh, can everyone see this okay? All right. So today we're going to be talking about how to choose your statistical software focusing on professional development. My name is Kyle Monahan. I did already introduce myself. Um, so I'm a senior data science specialist here uh, in TTS. And I, I work uh, with the entire data lab team as well as the larger Tufts community uh, to support students, staff, and faculty. Uh, you might wonder um, a little bit about me. So I'm actually originally from Albany, New York. I spent some time working in environmental health and environmental sciences. This is a map I made of the Hudson, of which I used to work uh, in New York on, on contaminant chronologies and, and a variety of uh, uh, things there. Now I'm a data science specialist, so I've learned to apply my skills around data science. Uh, I also am, uh, tend to be over-caffeinated. I mention this because if at any point you have a question, if I talk too fast, if I went over something too quickly, you're always welcome um, to, to let me know and I can, uh, I can do that. Uh, I can always re review something um, for you. So I want this to be uh, something that is really helpful to you and, and you can kind of have that sort of Q&A time. Um, so first off, I want to say welcome. Uh, all of my presentations are meant to be kind of open and, and not assume any background in, in, in coding. Uh, this presentation is exactly like that. If you have any questions, I hope this is a wel welcoming and, and pleasant environment for you. So that's my number one goal is to make sure that we, we don't assume anything and that you have a, a relatively fun time here tonight. So um, all slides, codes, and recording are available on the website. They're also available at this link. This is more for the asynchronous content. Uh, so if you're watching this recording and you're at home, as, as we are recording, uh, you can either go to the website that, that was posted in the chat, or you can go to this URL here if you're watching the recorded version of me. All right, so a little background about us, who we are here today. Um, uh, who is attending? It's a lot of people in the 
um, maybe professors at universities, research assistants. Uh, this is um, a word map where the frequency of the word in response uh, to the survey, this is disaggregated anonymous survey data. Um, in terms of job descriptions, we have people from a wide area of the nutrition fields, a lot of people from academia, but also people from a variety of research and, and private sector programs. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, I just wanted to th think it would be cool to, to show you a couple of visualizations about who we are as a group. Um, also, we, we come from all around the world. So welcome everyone from around this world. There's even more people from when I when I made this visualization. So we're, we're topping 800. It's really exciting to be here with everyone. So the goals that I have for us today uh, are as follows. We'll start by discussing some of the professional uh, uh, roles that you might find yourself doing or, or being interested in uh, while you're while you're working through these things. We'll compare. Uh, we'll provide an overview of what R is. We'll compare R to other statistical programs, and then we'll learn about what you can do with R and other programs. We'll take the time to go through each interface with each program, so programs like SAS, SPSS, etc., and we'll so talk about how you might select a software to use. We'll also give you a chance to learn a bit about resources that you have, uh, both if you're here at Tufts, and also resources available to the wider community. One thing that I don't have noted here is I've actually already recorded a longer format, like a deeper dive into these topics that's in asynchronous right, format. So you can watch that in your spare time. If you think I'm moving too quickly, you can always pause me and, uh, and, and take a look at things a little bit slower. So uh, a couple learning objectives, I always like to have learning objectives for what we're going to achieve today as well as goals. Our objectives are mainly to differentiate between data roles, analysts, scientists, and engineer, what these things mean. Understand the strengths of R versus programs like SAS, SPSS, et cetera, and understanding that each kind of has their own benefit, right? And that when we want to use a language, we choose it because of its unique benefits. And, and also being a little comfortable in the confusion of selecting software and knowing a little bit about how we might compare them. And then finally, learning a bit more and, and hopefully enabling all of us to develop these skills on our own. That's probably my, one of my number one goals for today. So um, for professional roles, you might see people talk about data scientists or data engineers or data analysts, right? Data blanks, right? You, you, if you look at a data scientist in practice, my title actually contains data science, right? Well, what do we do? Well, we're really uh, doing uh, applied statistics in sort of an end-to-end -end format. We might do some data cleaning. We'll make a model that has commonly a predictive goal, uh, but not always a predictive goal, depending on the project. And we present our findings. So we, we come up with some findings and we present them, either if you're in a research role to a faculty committee or to a granting agency, or um, if you're in the private sector to maybe your supervisor or another group or department. Um, data engineers are similar, right? Because we have to do the data cleaning to get it in the right format, but data engineers tend to do um, larger data sets. So if you have data sets, say, across multiple countries, let's say uh, CVS, for example, is a large business to business data set. Um, let's say you wanted to look at sales data across all of C CVS, you would need a data engineer for that because there's so many locations and so many different formats for that data. Also, data analysts are a really important role. So they uh, bridge business knowledge or, or uh, specific expert level knowledge and statistics and communication. So they might be the bridge between a marketing program and looking at uh, creating, say, a Tableau dashboard for to see how effective a certain marketing campaign might be. So these focus more on the sort of private sector approaches, but diving in this data scientist approach, we'll see some interesting things. So a data scientist can be a statistician, depending on the company role, kind of requires some background in math, programming, communication of results, and sometimes subject knowledge. Uh, but it really depends on the organization and the size of the team as to what these roles look like. And, and we'll revisit this in the next slide as well. So uh, a lot of times, if you ask what a data scientist does, about 79% of the time, they're going to be organizing data, uh, at least according to Forbes in 2016. I feel like that's probably, if anything, has increased in, in terms of size. So that's about 80% of the time organizing data. Data engineers, that's their whole role, right? They're, they're doing the organization. Um, 
And so for research, when we think about how these titles might exist in the research role or in the um, educational or higher education section, um, these titles can vary by project scope. So if you have a data cleaning uh, process to do, you might hire a data analyst. You also might hire a research assistant, right? If there's a, some expert level knowledge you need, say about stunting, if you're working with USAID and you have a, a data set that's been collected in a specific area and you're looking to look at stunting as your main outcome, you might hire a research assistant that has some experience in that. Um, you, you also could find yourself doing this in an internship as well. Um, so. There's also communication focus roles where you might be a data analyst, but you're doing some web development. Uh, maybe you're working in public relations and things like that. So the key takeaway here is to think about the tasks and the roles that you might do. And remember to leave time in data cleaning. If, you're, if you happen to be uh, organizing a grant or something like that, you know that's 80% of the time up to. And thinking about these tasks and roles and how we wanna be involved is I think an important potential practice. Uh, so now you might wonder, why do I keep mentioning R, <laughs> right? We've talked about these professional roles. How does R fit into this ecosystem? And, and what is R? So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit through uh, what R is and why we're focusing in around R for, for the moment. Um, and then we'll compare R to all of those other uh, uh, statistical software that you might have heard of. So R is a fully featured statistical analysis software. It's also a programming language and it's actually a Turing complete programming language. If you didn't go to school for computer science, a Turing complete just means it, it is viewed as, as equal to other uh, programming languages, right? It is a true programming language and there's a lot of things you can do with it. And Turing has to do with a certain test that has uh, um, implications for its completeness. Uh, and it also resembles Stata. SAS, SPSS, and Python, and other uh, statistical programming languages you might have heard of. R came to be from Ross and Robert Gentleman, uh, the Department of Statistics at the University of Auckland. Uh, it was developed to really be an easier to read language than previous languages, and it actually became popular in statistics. Um, the benefit and the reason why I mention R so much right now is because it's free for you, and it's free for everyone. So it's an open source product and it's free for you to use. You can share your code with anyone, anywhere. It's cross-platform, so you can use it on Windows, on Mac OS, and on Ubuntu or other Linux distributions. And it's also good at multi-core task distributions. The benefit is that you could use it on a, like a large-scale computer on Amazon Web Services, right? Um, the reason why I'm focusing on R in this introductory presentation is just because you're free to download and use it. So if you don't have access to any of the paid software we'll talk about today uh, through your higher education institution, or your employer, um, you're welcome to use R to go through our materials. So R consists of two main things, R, the programming language, and R Studio, the IDE, the Integrated Development Environment. This is just where you write the code. Anytime you hear some data scientist say, oh, just use the IDE to compile, right? It, what they're saying is where you write the code. It's an integrated development environment. And I like to think of it this way. In order for us to drive a car, we need the dashboard of the car and the engine, right? We don't go in when we wanna accelerate and add more gas into the chambers, right? We just press the gas pedal. In the same way, uh, we are using R, which is the engine, the driver, the language and the kernel that we use to control and, and to work with R and, and the, the things that will load into R. Um, but our studio is the dashboard, right? That gives us a way to interact with the engine easier. So we will use our studio today, but R is the engine for everything we'll do. So although we won't open R today, we will. You or we we are unlikely to open R today. We will use our studio as our interface uh, to that. So let's uh, start by opening R. So the first thing I always like to do is open R. Um, and so I'm actually going to open R Studio. If you haven't installed R Studio yet, that's okay. I'll have some instructions that you'll be able to see um, to go through that. But this is what R looks like. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is increase the size of the text so you can actually see what I'm doing. I like to make it really large so that you can, you can actually see. And we'll see a couple things here. 
So first off, we see the console here. This is where we can write the code. This is the, the connection to that engine, right? The, the place where we can access the R kernel. It gives me a lot of frightening information about the version of R, the platform it's running on, and other things. Um, over here in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, we can see the environment. This is where objects that I create in R will appear. Or if I import data, this is where all of the things that store are stored in my memory that I'm currently working on will appear here. I can also, by clicking on this tab that says history, move through the tabs, just like I would in Chrome or Safari. If I was on the internet, I can move through tabs and move through different interfaces in R. The same thing down here, we can see some files down here, and we can move through these tabs accordingly. So this is the general interface to R. It has an environment to store our values that we're working with in our memory. We have a console that allows us to run commands and the ability to open scripts or files that have a things to do list in them. So these are scripts up here. We could open those files like so. We'll see this general approach to designing a program uh, is very similar across our program. So the key things to take away here are there's a console, there's an environment where variables and other data are stored. And there's some way to load in files, right? Some files ability where we can look at files. All right. Any questions on this so far? All right, if you have any questions, feel free to chat. Um, so if you haven't installed R before, you can go to go.tufts.edu slash installing R, and I'll put that in the chat. Um, and you'll be able to go to this web page that takes you through um, how to install R in R Studio, uh, both for Windows and for Mac OS and Linux. So you can go through that if you need to. Now we're at the stage where we will be comparing R with other statistical software. So I bet you use a wide variety of statistical software. We're going to start with one of my favorites, SPSS, IBM's platform for statistics. Um, and it is, uh, it's a great platform. On the left here, we see R. And so we see our console, the thing that window into the kernel, the way we get error codes and other things from R right in here. And then here's the environment for, for R, right? The same interface we saw before in R. And over here in the SPSS um, window, we see what looks like Excel, right? We see rows and columns for data, and that is called the data view. So because SPSS has this data view, it sort of resembles Excel. This makes initial exploration easier. It has pull down menus and social science tools, um, but data manipulation and cleaning can be more difficult in SPSS. So also one thing to note, for each of these software, we have a getting started guide. And you'll be able to access those uh, um, links through the website, as Emily mentioned. Um, but we have this getting started guide. You can also go to this URL, toughstuffbox.com slash v slash getting started with SPSS. Those are all available on the, the website for the conference. And you'll be able to download and get started with all of these uh, training materials if you'd uh, like to do that. So we have getting started with SPSS and then some additional tutorial materials that uh, you can access. So let's open SPSS and take a quick look. So here we have SPSS. By default, it's automatically thinking, are we going to import data? One of the nice things about SPSS is that it allows you, when the second you open it, it asks you, hey, would you like to import some data? If I wanted to, I can click on sample files here and I can say open the accidents.save file just to show you what it looks like to open a file. So again, I clicked on sample files, accidents.save, and this is a built-in data set inside of, inside of SPSS. And I can click open. And now we have some variables that we've loaded into uh, SPSS from one of the sample data sets. You can see there's a data view and a variable view, and we can look at our data almost like it's in Excel. But we can highlight sections, we can double click on them to edit them, just like Excel. The other benefit of SPSS is that it gives you a chance to go to analyze, and you can actually look at a wide variety of statistical analysis um, in a menu form. We'll actually see that Stata provides this functionality as well. 
Uh, so it's a great way to learn potentially how you could uh, sort and work with different analyses. So this is SBSS. Now I mentioned Stata. This is another very popular statistical program. This is actually one of my favorite statistical programs. I think I say this about all of them though, so I guess I'd have to rank them or something. So we have R here on the left. We have Stata here on the right. Um, Stata is a, a really great program. You can see some similarities actually here. We have the console here in R and we have the command window at the bottom here in Stata. We have the history tab over here on the right in R, and we have a history window here on the left in Stata. We have variables on the right in Stata, and we have an environment that's filled with variables in R. So the benefit, the secret to this, is that once you learn one of these software, those skills are transferable, right? Once you get an idea of the ethos of why we do these things in statistical software, it enables you to learn other softwares as well. So because the general approach to using them is the same, even if the code is different. So comparing R and Stata, they have a similar design, like we mentioned before, but they have a bit of a different focus. So uh, Stata has both a scripts and, and language, so you can write uh, Stata code. It can be a bit harder to control for the most advanced tasks, but I actually love Stata. It's a little bit potentially easier to start out with than R. Um, and you can also use the menus uh, to explore uh, the different types of, of code that you could go through. We also have a using installing Stata guide. If you wanna learn more about Stata, you can access it through there. And let's open up Stata. I've actually already opened Stata. I'm so excited about <laughs> opening Stata that I have it open here for you. Uh, and so you can see basically like what we saw in R, right? We have a history command here. This shows all of our commands. So if I were to type uh, some command like clear, you know, it's going to appear over here in the history. And that's just the word clear. It clears uh, this console here. We have the command prompt. This is where you type. You can type things down in the command prompt and they, they will be sent as commands to Stata. And we have the variable section here. This is just like the environment, very similar to the environment in R. All right, so comparing R versus Python, you may have heard of Python before. It is another programming language. It's also used for a lot of data analysis uh, tasks. Uh, on the left here, we have RStudio. And on the right here, we have, uh, this is Jupyter Notebooks, for example, in Python. Uh, R and Python are relatively easy to transition between. Once you learn one, the approach is similar uh, for the other one. They are two different languages. So I always like to say it's kind of like if you know some Spanish and you want to speak French, if you know some of the Latin roots, it can be useful to move between the two. But they are two different languages, right? So you would have to learn, learn each one. I find R better for data cleaning. R is very fast for data cleaning. Whereas Python focuses more on machine learning. Right. So if you wanted to do machine learning, uh, Python might be a better bet. However, I I'm a little biased because I love R so much. Um, and I would say that I can do my entire workflow uh, in R. I actually teach a class in Python, and I could move that class entirely to R and have no trouble. So I'm a huge fan of R myself. I think you can do a lot within R, and it's a great um, program to learn. Uh, so we do have, thing. I don't want to be too biased, we do have some materials for learning Python. Um, I also do program in Python as well. I just have a sweet spot in my heart for R. So let's open Python. I don't want to, I don't want to disenfranchise any Python users we have. Um, I'm going to open what's called Jupyter Notebook now. And so this is a uh, it's sort of like an IDE for Python. It's actually a little bit different. It's going to open up a command prompt and then automatically run a series of scripts in order to load this program called Jupyter Notebooks. Here we have Jupyter Notebooks. In order to use this, I would need to create a new notebook or script. So you can see how the fact that it has this um, this program running in a browser, plus this frightening window with a bunch of code in it, um, the amount of background needed to, to use Python is slightly higher, I would say, than R, because in R we have RStudio, that dashboard of the car that makes it a little easier. And in, uh, in, R, in Python, we don't really have as much of that. Uh, we have Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebook, um, but they can be a little harder to use. So this is what Python looks like, in case you wanted to, to see it. 
Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is R and SAS. SAS is a great skill set to have. I know we have some SAS users here um, today. And comparing the two, you know, there are some similarities. We we do have the ability to look at files in the in the SAS Explorer window. Um, we can look at the results of our code. Um, we can edit our code in the editor window, um, just like we can edit our R code um, in in R Studio. Uh, but there are some differences between R and SAS. So if I click through here, um, it, I would actually say it's not very easy to transition between them. I would say if you have a SAS script, so if you're working with ICD-10 codes, if you're working with NHANES data, any of those data sets that come in SAS format or that have a SAS data cleaning script, it can be easier to just run that data cleaning script in SAS. I'll tell you that a lot of the uh, medical and especially governmental, say Medicaid data, will have their, their data in SAS format. And so it can be very nice uh, to start in SAS and, and to, to get used to doing that a little bit before moving into R. So that, that can be a useful approach to take. Uh, so if you want to learn SAS, there are some how-to tutorials that you can go through as well. So let's open up SAS. I'm going to open up um, just SAS 9.4 here um, on this machine. And you can see we have our Explorer window, right? This is where we could explore through things. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about libraries and what they are and what setting a library means. Um, we can see our editor window here uh, where we can e edit and, and type code. We have our log window here. So this is very similar to the results you might get in our in your console area and then our output as well. These are sort of different a little bit, but uh, similar to what things you can do in, in R as well. So um, one thing to know about SAS that I really like is that uh, SAS does a lot of work to keep their uh, calculations consistent. So you know that if you're using a certain um, statement in, in SAS, uh, that it will be consistent across versions and things like that. Um, and with R, you sometimes have to double check that, but that's one of the benefits of SAS. All right. So um, I'll pause for a second here. Are there any questions? I just want to check the chat. Feel free to ask any questions you might have as we go through this. At this point, we're now getting into some esoteric programs that you may or may not have heard of. Um, I actually was originally trained in, in civil and environmental engineering, so I came across MATLAB. Um, I will say that I used MATLAB for some time. Both are great at complex analyses. Uh, I'll say that MATLAB is really excellent at signal processing. Um, uh, electrical engineers use it. Um, civil and environmental engineers use it. And I would say if you're processing, say, a signal from a sensor or a uh, maybe you have to do some digital signal processing to, say, a uh, audio file. Um, one example of this is we were looking to do a machine learning classifier for um, wheeze to try to detect or to classify between pneumonia associated wheeze and asthma associated wheeze to try to see if we could classify those, that subset of audio files. And all of that uh, signal processing as well as the machine learning uh, was done in MATLAB. So it can be a great platform uh, to, to learn to, to do some of those things. If you want to look at MATLAB, I'll just open it up here. Um, MATLAB is commonly available in a lot of uh, academic environments. If you have an engineering school at your, at your location, um, it can be a good thing to start with. And so you see here we have a current folder window over here, which is just the current location where MATLAB is looking for files. We'll talk a little bit about working directories and, and where programs look for files more broadly. Uh, so whenever you see current folder or working directory, uh, that is where the program is looking for files. And that's actually a key takeaway. Um, every, each one of these programs is going to be searching for files in a specific place. And a lot of what we'll do will be making sure that the program we want can see the data that we want to work with and that it can work with it. Um, we also see beyond that current folder, we also see the command window right in the center here. This is how, this is how we will submit commands to MATLAB and tell MATLAB what to do. You'll note that this double caret approach is very similar to what uh, R's command window looks like. And it's, um, you'll, you'll see that in Python as well as a, as a kind of a symbol for where we could write commands. And then on the far right, we see workspace. This is very similar to the environment tab, to the uh, environment tab in R, to the variables tab in Stata. So you can see that even in MATLAB, which is really focused on engineering, we have all these similarities across the interface. So like I said before, when we're learning one program, 
we're actually learning many programs. Even if the language is different, the approach generally is the same. Uh, so if there's one thing I want you to feel a little bit now is that all these scary statistical programs are not super scary. They just hide it behind all this terminology and these buttons, right? But they're really doing almost exactly the same thing. So that's MATLAB. Um, we do have some materials on MATLAB if you want to learn it. I've already opened MATLAB. I got too into opening MATLAB. If you're just starting in statistics, let's say you've heard about Bayesian stuff and you're like, ah, I saw this science paper, this nature paper, and they were talking about Bayesian stats. I really want to learn Bayesian stuff, but all I learned in, in my master's or my degree was, was uh, JASP, right? Or was, um, sorry, frequentist stuff. If you want to learn that, you can actually use JASP, J-A-S-P. It is free and open source. So you can click on JASP here, or you can install it on your own computer. So JASP is totally free. And uh, you can actually uh, open a file and do some descriptive statistics. They have t-tests, ANOVA, mixed models, and all of these have both a frequentist and a Bayesian approach to them. The other benefit is that uh, JASP actually has tutorials where you can actually learn how to do some of these things and how to interpret uh, the results. Uh, the cool thing about JASP as well is that it's actually written with an R backend. So a lot of the work that they do is, uh, is using R as their statistical engine. So JASP is super cool. Feel free to try it out because it's totally free. And it's really good if you're just getting started in stats. So we've opened JASP. Are there any questions at this point at all? Feel free to chat if there are. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to also mention, how do we choose? So we've talked about statistical software. We've compared them. You've seen me get excited about all the interfaces and their little uh, similarities across their interfaces. But how do we choose? And I will suggest to you to ask these few questions. The first question is, what does my advisor or my company or my supervisor or my funding agent organization use, right? If my advisor is using SAS, right, and I'm a student, I might want to learn some SAS so we can communicate uh, easily um, and, and, and better understand each other. If my company only has a license for SAS, well, then I'm limited to SAS and maybe R because it's open source. Um, if my, say, if my supervisor only knows Stata, then I might want to use Stata because then we can communicate. He can read my code or she can read my code or they can read my code and they can get started on these sorts of things and, and kind of we can communicate a little easier. Um, if, we, if we're looking at a, a faculty member who's applying to funding agencies, I mean, I don't think they normally care uh, particularly about which statistical software you use, but if there is a, a focus, say if I was working with IBM, I might want to choose SBSS or one of their uh, Python distributions that they, they develop because you know they'll, they'll probably use their in-house sort of thing. Um, the, the real question though, I think is what the best tool for the grant or the proposal or the research question, or if you're in the private sector, the business logic might be. And we'll talk a little bit about how to compare these tools and, and summarize what we've talked about more broadly um, before. Um, I do see a great, a great question on the, uh, the Tufts resources on learning SAS again. Yes, so I will uh, go right up and do that now for you so you can take a look. Um, this is toughstylebox.com slash v slash installing SAS. Now for all of these, uh, you may not be able to access uh, SAS if you're not at Tufts and you're, um, you're oh, thank you for, for that, Emily, that's excellent. Um, and so you can, you can feel free to click on that link as well and access some of these materials. So, all right. Great questions. So we've talked a little bit about the tool and we'll get, dive in more, more detail in the next slide as well. Uh, for students, I would also suggest that you take a look at what job titles you might want to, uh, let's say you're a student right now or a graduate student. Um, I would ask yourself, if you're looking to go into academia, look at what key new professors are using in terms of their software and what they think is the popular skill set to have, right? A great skill set to have, especially around stats. Talking to your advisor, I think is critical. 
for students that are maybe in their master's program or undergraduate, you know, thinking about what job title you want if you do choose to go into the private sector and making sure that you have some in-demand skills for that job title is a great approach. Um, I advise a lot of students in our data analytics or data science or nutrition data science programs. One of the things I do is I go through with them I select a job title that they, they feel that they might be interested in. And we go through, we look at 20 or so job descriptions. We highlight all those skills and we connect those to software that they might wanna learn in their last year to make sure that they're ready to apply to those jobs and be successful in those jobs. Um, so you can uh, review these slides as well and try them out. Um, you can always switch if needed. So if you start in R and then you're like, oh, I really wanted to learn SAS, right? You can always switch. It's not like you're committed to one. I also want to show you this comparative list that we have. So um, this is also available online and you'll get all of these slides. So don't worry, it's available um, on the, the, the Friedman um, Research Symposium website. Um, and these have comparing statistical software. So this has um, comparing SPSS, Stata, SAS, R, MATLAB, their interfaces, their learning curve, so how challenging they might be to start out with, the approach to data cleaning, the data analysis, and the visualization uh, ability for each one, and various specialties that you might have. Uh, so I can actually put this in the chat if you want to look at it, toughs.box.com slash v. Um, I'll actually put it in the chat afterwards. I do see a question came in, so excellent um, question. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's a good point. So um, if you want experience outside of the course environment, let's say I want to learn about SAS or SPSS or Stata, um, the, uh, and you want to, to better figure out a way to apply that. With SAS, it's a little bit hard, but SAS does have training. So let's say we wanted to, I'll just look up uh, SAS trainings. Now, some of these are paid, and I, I, I think you, you could certainly ask if you're lucky enough. Uh, it seems like um, in this case, you're focusing on an employer if you're employed. Um, I think you could take a SAS training. Um, I have gone through a few of the free ones. I will say that some of the ones that are, are paid, you might be able to find other examples online. Um, I, there are a lot of online trainings. For anyone who's at Tufts or at other um, educational institutions, you might want to reach out to your library and ask if you have a LinkedIn Learning subscription. Uh, a lot of the uh, areas of higher education do have LinkedIn Learning. Um, and the benefit of LinkedIn Learning is that they have a series of courses uh, on SAS that are really excellent. And if you have, if your school has access to LinkedIn Learning, you can actually um, go through all of these trainings for SAS, um, they have SPSS, Stata, um, and a variety of softwares, and they really focus on the software skills. So they won't teach you the stats necessarily, but they will teach you how to use the software, why you might want to use this software, um, and, and things like that. And actually, SAS Institute contributes a lot of these trainings uh, to LinkedIn Learning. So, uh, so feel free to check that out. That's a great question, Graham. Um, uh, next question is around what is weak strong or scope of statistical software analyses mean? Can I give an example? Yeah, you know that, this is me making a claim about uh, these software. I would say that um, the, the key thing is about keeping up with the, the most up-to-date, say, let's say you wanted to, for example, there's a new way to do um, bootstrap uh, to iterate over the values that you might put into a deep learning uh, matrix specifically for remote sensing data. This is a very novel approach. It actually was published two months ago. The only place I can implement that is R currently because R has a package that was published with the paper um, and I can implement it there. I will say uh, that um, I will say that, it, that so that sometimes can be a little harder to do in SBSS because it's just not built to do that type of analysis, right? So the, the scope, the amount of statistical analysis that we can do in SBSS is just lower than something like Stata or R uh, because it focuses on making it easier to use the statistical analyses that you can do in SBSS rather than doing all of the new methods from all the new papers, et cetera. Um, so that's what I mean by weak or strong scope of statistical software analysis. 
Um, but feel free to if if you if you have any other suggestions for this, it's welcome. It's only written by me, so it could be biased. Uh, I, I, there's a question here on is it okay, uh, how valuable is it to be certified in a programming languages versus just being experienced. Uh, so um, certifications, depending on your field, can be really helpful. Uh, I've actually done some of the Amazon Web Services certifications myself. It really is up to what uh, career you're looking to go into and how that fits into your career uh, um, approach. So I think some certifications can be important. So SAS certification is one example uh, where it can be very important and very helpful uh, for your career. There are R certifications, but I think the R certifications, other than the certified instructor certification, um, they can be good and bad, right? There's a lot of variability in the R one. Um, a lot of R content is free. So, you know, you can go and, and get a badge in, in R by taking some of their online trainings. Um, if you are able to access LinkedIn Learning, you can actually put badges on your profile. I've gone through many LinkedIn Learning trainings, and I've actually had recruiters reach out to me and say, oh, I've, I've seen you've done the advanced uh, cloud computing trainings, and you've done these on your resume. I see this. So that, that can be really beneficial if you go through some of the trainings um, and you you know, if, if there isn't any other example of you doing that on your resume, uh, that can be a, a great question, a great um, thing to add. So uh, feel free to chat me if I didn't answer that well enough, but I think that's hopefully good. Um, and Jamie, great question. How easy, difficult is it to work with public SAS data sets example and Haynes in R Python? Have I got a slide for you at the end of this? I have an example of working with N Haynes in R just for you, not, not, I didn't plan it, I swear. Um, but I have something where we could go through that together. So uh, and it'll it'll be um, content that will be uh, recorded that I could provide to you uh, afterwards. There's a link that you'll see. Um, but we won't go through that section uh, specifically today. Uh, but yes, so it can be, it's not as easy to necessarily work with stuff like N. Haynes in in R and SAS, there is a new package specifically for NHANES called NHANES R, uh, which I've, I've used before and it works quite well. If you don't understand what a package is, we will talk about that. So good question. It can be easy depending on your approach to doing it. Uh, and um, yes, so Shirley asks, uh, what is the best software to work with big data? I love that question. Um, I think it sort of depends on the data's format. So if you have a really big database, right, and you want to do something and it has it's very good metadata, uh, it might be easier for you to work within something like SAS. But if you have a bunch of Excel flat files, like they're like just text files, giant text files that you got from some government database, it might be easier for you to start an R, especially if you have uh, like a some computing support at your university or at your, at your job, um, then it could be easier to start there. It sort of depends on how the data are stored and what you're looking to do with them. Um, but I can provide some readings potentially for uh, um, some best software to work with big data as well. That's a good question. And Lauren, excellent question as well. How might we compare the technical support available for each software? I, I don't have this <laughs> in the, the, the table, that should be there. So what I'm going to do is I will edit this table at some point over the next few days during this conference. So if you go back to this link um, during that time, the which statistical software to use, and this link will be sent to you with the recording and everything, uh, you'll be able to see it on the. So excuse me, you'll be able to see it on the website. So if you go back to that link, um, you'll you'll be able to see my update, and I will talk about technical support. Personally, I've had great experience with SAS technical support. They are excellent. I know status technical support uh, myself. Uh, they are also extremely excellent. I love working with them. Chuck Huber is a good friend, and he answers many of my questions. R doesn't have technical support, but what we do have is a um, a community of committed volunteers, uh, one, myself being one, um, who will answer questions if you if you post them online. And we will talk about how to get help and things like that next. So. Um, Kyle, uh, one, and you might actually be getting to it with this slide. We had a, a question about which program may be preferable for um, graphs, charts, and visualizations. Oh, excellent. Thank you for noting that. I didn't see it come in, so that's a good one. Um, yes, so I would say, uh, for visualizations, um, you know, R is pretty high up there. 
Tableau is another program that I use. However, Tableau is very expensive, right? If your company or your school doesn't have a license for Tableau, um, Tableau can be quite expensive to use. You do have Tableau Public, which you can use for free, but that means your data must be public. So if you're working with individually identifiable medical records data, say you want to publish this data, you might not want to use Tableau to start out. So personally, I like to use a mix of R, um, Tableau, and, and Stata sometimes if I'm working uh, with an econometrics person or someone say in community health that uses Stata, I will, I'll switch into Stata. Um, SAS can make some beautiful visualizations. I just find it doesn't focus on it as much, uh, but it certainly can. Uh, so I would say R, Tableau, and, um, and Stata. Python is certainly up there, but it just requires you to write a little bit more code potentially to do what you want to do. So. Um, those are my suggestions. So we try out R and try out uh, Tableau. Thank you for adding that. All right, so um, I just wanna mention that we talked about this a little bit. There are a wide variety of people who have used R before. This is an example of someone who's used R to do some uh, principal component analysis around site conservation to try to figure out um, something about the on-site biodiversity and how people perceive this uh, in the Singaporean context. So that whole process was done in R. Same thing here, we have an electronic health record um, system and uh, extracting out cardiovascular disease records. And this was also done in part in R. And so this section here, another paper, is looking at um, human exposomes. So it's one of the uh, uh, ph phenomes and, and exposomes, so part of the larger omics approach. Um, and this is actually out of Harvard originally, it was published in Scientific Data. Uh, this, a lot of the backend stuff in here was in R. Uh, you'll also know that there are other softwares that they use in their, what's called a pipeline. All that is is just connected software that is doing something. Uh, and, and R is within this pipeline. So it's a cool approach to talk about. All right, and so also you, you are also an R user potentially after this uh, session. I hope you feel empowered to be an R user and to try out these different softwares. You might wonder how, and this kind of talks about technical support a bit. Um, if you're at Tufts, you can go to the Medford or Boston campus. Our labs are de-densified, but you are able to go there. You can also access things remotely. Um, one thing to note, RStudio does offer a cloud compute um, approach with RStudio Cloud. You can go to RStudio, you can just Google RStudio Cloud, it'll come up. You can get started for free, uh, but if you need a bunch of memory or storage space, they'll start charging you, kind of like AWS or Amazon Web Services. So just so you know, if you're beyond Tufts, you could use RStudio Cloud to access RStudio. You can also just install it on your computer if that works for you. So if you want to install it in your computer, here's some instructions. You've probably seen them before during our installing our section. But if you haven't, um, that's just uh, available here. This is the same link as what I posted in the chat before. So if you're wondering if they're different, uh, the other, the earlier link redirects to this one. So, all right. Any questions? All right, so I just want to have this moment for a time check uh, if there are any other questions. Um, there are other slides here. I'm not going to go through them today, but I do have a recording of me going through them. These talk about things like remote computing, high performance computing, um, details on how to get started with those sorts of things, some additional details on getting help, um, looking up uh, at things on a website called Stack Overflow. That's actually the one cool trick that data scientists don't want you to know about. It's how we have job security. I'm just kidding. Uh, but also, it is a very important skill for working with computing and troubleshooting. So there's a bunch of slides on that. There's also a recording, which I will um, upload and make available to you. Uh, for you to walk through on your own time. Um, also, I do know I talk sort of fast, so you'll be able to pause that and, uh, and, and walk through that as well. So I will um, pause my sharing now, and I'll leave us uh, a couple moments to uh, ask any questions you might have. And then I think we'll move to, uh, to uh, a different presenter to go into some examples. So if there are any questions, feel free to put them in the chat for me, and I will address them. I hope I got all of them, but if I missed anything, feel free to ask. All right, 
looks like there are no questions. So I will um, uh, hand it over to uh, um, our next presentation pre presenter to go through the uh, um, the examples that we'll go through. All right. Um, so uh, I need to pin myself. Um, so Casey, would we want to just take a little bit of a break and then make yeah. for, for those coming? Um, one, those if you're going to um, the data quality for nutrition and dashboard sessions, now's a great time. Stretch your legs before that wonderful presentation um, and then come back, you know, refreshed and ready to, to walk through some examples um, in which case we'll start off in R. Yep. And for those that are still on the call right now, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. You can um, unmute yourself, video on, off. We, we're here and have these sort of lull five minutes. So happy to, to uh, bounce ideas off and still be available until six o'clock. Hi, Emily, can you hear me? Yep. Thank you. Um, so I'm trying to decide whether to jump on to the other session, the data quality, or to stay on this one. Um, what kind of examples are you going to like walk through in, in this session? Is it okay. like comparing across the software? Sorry, I should have read it, but I was just, if you could speak a little to like what, what, the diff what we're gonna do right now in this one. Yeah, um, I can. So I'll be the first one presenting. And so the plan is we're going to start in R and then we're going to move across three different statistical softwares and we're going to be going over general things like um, setting up libraries, setting a working directory, reading in data, um, and then sort of just the beginning stages of just getting to look at your data um, in three different softwares. And so we're going to spend about 15 minutes in each software. So it's going to be like a very um, very short condensed sort of like intro and it sort of sets up for tomorrow's session as well so okay okay cool and and yeah focused on our data and sas and all three of them then doing that okay cool great thank yep. you yep uh emily also uh i can't seem to 
figure out how to get PowerPoint to work because I haven't used it in ages. Is it actually, is it showing the, the PowerPoint slide or is this, are we on something different? It's showing the slide, but I can see all your other slides off to the left, like slide, your slide numbers, but the content's visible and I'd say big enough. Okay. Yeah, I keep trying to put the slide full screen, but it just goes to presenter mode. And Kyle, I think this would be a great question for you um, from Graham. Is Unix or Linux considered a software compare Bowl to R, SAS, GIS, Python, et cetera? Uh, that is a great question, Graham. I would say, so Unix and Linux are an op operating system. It's like an alternative to Windows or Mac OS. There are statistical programs that work on Unix and Linux. Uh, so one would be R, right? There are builds for R that work on the Unix or the Linux open source uh, software platform. Um, so certainly, uh, I would say that Unix is Linux. It's like a a bit larger actually than our SAS, GIS, et cetera, of these uh, specific programs because Unix and Linux are, are operating systems, um, but they are really excellent. They're open source. Uh, I've been um, in the, the Unix community, specifically a few uh, um, uh, flavors of Linux and, and it's, uh, it's all volunteer work uh, and it's really fun if you wanna get into it. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, there's totally open source operating system. So instead of running Windows, you would run uh, Linux, which could then run R, right? Could run a statistical software for you to do analysis and things like that. Does does that help uh, answer the question potentially? Well, feel free to chat if you have any follow-up questions. Did you want help getting your PowerPoint out of presenter mode? Um. I think for now we can just leave it as is. I think it's displaying well enough. I'm going to okay. be switching over There's to R. There's just one different. button that you need to press. Okay. Uh, it's in that slideshow tab at the top of your of your screen. If you click yeah. that, there should be a little checkbox over to your right. Uncheck Use Presenter Mode. Uh, one more over. To oh, you. I see. Now when yeah. you uh, now when you go into slideshow, it'll just do duplicate. There we go. I haven't used PowerPoint in it's been years. So that's that's helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Kyle, we have another great question. Um, are there stereotypes associated with different softwares that are useful to be aware of? I'm afraid I'm going to stereotype myself by answering this question. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say <laughs> I don't know how to safely answer this question. Um, I think, uh, yeah, there definitely are. I think the best way to, um, to, I would say a lot of the um, uh, softwares that are more expensive, it sort of uh, assumes that uh, you have money in the project maybe, right? Like uh, I, I do use Tableau as well. And people, when they see my Tableau visualizations, they think, wow, like you have a license for Tableau that's so expensive, right? So maybe they judge me a little bit when they first meet me. Um, I will say that uh, definitely there are assumptions. I mean, um, SAS, a lot of times I see medical users use SAS. I, when I hear about SAS, I, I think about a lot of medical studies, RCTs that I've worked on, you know, that, that's kind of what I think about when I think of SAS. Uh, when I think of R, it's open source. So it's a really wide variety. It's sort of hard to, to know exactly what's, where someone's coming from in R. Um, with SPSS, a lot of psychology departments, so I actually did a degree in psychology and I, I originally learned SPSS in psychology. And I think a lot of uh, people who get degrees in that as well as liberal arts degrees may start in SPSS or STATA. Um, but I think these are not necessarily like stereotypes to know about, but rather like use cases where these softwares are useful and helpful. Um, certainly, you know, they're, they're something to be considered because if you're in a certain uh, department, they might more likely use one software over another. So I might, uh, I might call them, you know, places that we tend to use them or something like that. Um, but yeah, yeah, ho hopefully that answers your question. Feel free to chat me if it, if it didn't, but really good questions here. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Kyle.